all of our ecosystems, whether it's on land or in the water, they all rely on each other. It doesn't matter if it's out of sight and a hundred fathoms deep in the water where you can't see it, it still is going to affect the shallower and the shallower onto the land. Eelgrass was an important thing for the fish that spawn, the crabs living amongst them, and it was also a, an important source of diet for our people. But they, they were they depleted in uh, a lot of the areas because of anchorages, and they would dredge up the, the eelgrass. And, and not only that, but raw sewage would be dumped over the side. And this had an effect on our, our seed plants. First Nations have been using estuaries from the dawn of time, thousands of years. Well, not only do First Nations like estuaries, but the people who came here like estuaries. We live at estuaries, we work at estuaries when we do our logging or we're fishing or we need a place to land that's sheltered. So estuaries have been not only good for people, but they've got that huge ecological impact as nurseries and that place where the land meets the sea and everything joins. One of the projects with Sea Change that has been lovely is the Salish Sea Marine Survival Project. And with that one, we were doing restoration and conservation of eelgrass. So we got to work all up and down the coast and have 23 different sites. When we pick a restoration site, we have to think about a whole lot of things. One thing is, is the damage going to be occurring again in the future? Mooring buoys are an issue. Unless there's some way that we can control mooring, we're not going to be trying to transplant eelgrass where there is a whole lot of boat mooring. Even if the boat's no longer on the buoy, the buoy is still having this effect on the eelgrass. Or you have to change the mooring up to something that doesn't have that bottom scouring effect, and there are moorings where that's possible. You know, and then we come to this other project that we're doing about debris removal and realizing that those things are really quite integrated, that if we can get the debris off the bottom, sometimes we can also put eelgrass in where the debris used to be. With marine debris, we're working within communities where we've already got contacts. And so we have an idea of where we should be looking first. We started with Genoa Bay for marine debris cleanup. We moved from Genoa Bay to Todd Inlet to Burgoyne Bay and then we did Degging Bay. The big tonnage was Genoa Bay. There were like 44 tons of stuff that was pulled out in a single day. We'll bring in a boat that's got some sonar on it and we'll find anomalies on the bottom based on the sonar. Sometimes we'll actually see a boat and so we know where the boat is, we make the mark. And the diver will do a search pattern picking up small debris into a basket and they've been marking the larger debris and harnessing so that we can haul it up with a winch or a crane. All of that stuff takes time and money. In one of our very first transplants, I put some eelgrass in and then I had to go away. And I came back later and already the crabs were moving in and the diversity of life was right there. And it was as if somebody had suddenly dropped in housing for the entire marine environment and everybody had got wind of it and they were all moving in. 